What is up, guys? It is the Blue Bloods, man. And I've been hinting at this collab for a little while, man. We got my guy, Leroy Frederick, wide receivers coach and director of football operations at All Corn State. And th this is something we wanted to bring, man. We're going to call it Coach's Corner and Weekly, man. We're going to bring recaps. And also, we're going to preview some of the biggest games of the next week across the FCS and even some of the FBS games as we move along, man. But, Coach, I appreciate you coming on the show, man, giving everyone a little bit of your time. Let people know a little bit about your story, what you do now, and um, what made you want to what made you want to hop on the show, man, and do and do these previews and recaps this year. Uh, first of all, man, let me just say thank you. Uh, I, I enjoy you, your content, everything that you bring to it, um, and I just appreciate the opportunity of working with you. Um, the, the The journey starts way back, man. Uh, Florida boy, born and raised. Uh, journey starts back in high school, uh, coming back and uh, giving time, uh, you know, a brief playing career in the CFL, Arena League. Uh, and Arena League is where I kind of found my home, uh, which at the time when it was around was a different time, you know, than fall football, spring football. Uh, so it allowed me to be home, work in the school system, and then also coach. Um, and that's kind of where I got the bug, the itch uh, to coach. And uh, so from there, you know, a guy by the name of Kevin Verdugo, who I'm much indebted to. Uh, I work with him at George Jenkins High School. Shout out George Jenkins. Um, and he gets the job at Fort Scott Community College and uh, calls me one day in a locker room. I'll never forget the story, Blue. Uh, I get a note in my locker saying, come to the front office. And I'm like, oh, man, you don't ever want that note in your locker saying, come to the front office. And I go, and they have a number. I say, this guy says, call him. And it's, you know, for Dugo. And uh, long story short, hey, man, I got this job. It's a junior college. When you're done, would love for you to come uh, be my coach. And, you know, old nine. And, like, well, I'm still playing. He's like, that's fine. We can work around all that. I just need you. Uh, and the journey began at Fort Scott Community College uh, way back in the early uh, early 2000s. So I'm kind of dating myself right now. But, uh, you know, start from there. Uh, three seasons at Fort Scott. From there, move on to Hutchinson Community College. Uh, Craig Jersel, uh, shout out to Coach Jers uh, for giving me the opportunity there to come on and be his uh, his offensive coordinator. Um, and then from there to Pearl River Community College uh, in Mississippi at the height of that program. Success, man. I was very blessed and fortunate to be able to work with Tim Haddon. Uh, some great Great, great, great athletes, man. Helped us along the way to win championships there. And uh, from there, uh, the story starts to spin toward Alcorn. Uh, have the opportunity to coach Steve McNair Jr., um, whose uncle happens to be Fred McNair. Um, I have a receiver there at Pearl River who is going to have Pro Day, who's going straight to the NFL from Pearl River Community College. And lo and behold, the quarterback that, uh, the agents got to come throw was Fred McNair. Uh, so I met Coach McNair there uh, while throwing to one of my former receivers. And our relationship started from there. And um, lo and behold, Jay Hobson gets the job, has an opportunity, you know, opening. Coach McNair, Coach Peck, those guys uh, suggest me, go interview. And here I am with uh, my boy, Blue. Hey man, I, I love it. And real quick before we get into, you know, before we get into all the games we talked about, you know, what 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 did it mean for you guys and the coaching staff to be the first SWAC team to knock off McNeese, man? And what were the keys to that? How'd you feel about the performance this weekend? Man, that was uh that was huge. Uh we had come close uh twice before that. Um and you know, both of those times and coming close, man, we're like, you know, we're right there. Uh, you know, a play here, a play there. Um, so now you fast forward to Saturday and, uh, you know, we didn't know how we, we thought we had a good week of practice. Uh, but coming off of that, uh, that situation at Tulane uh, where the wheels just kind of fell off quickly, uh, we didn't know what really to expect. Um, and the kids came out, man. And, and when I tell you, they fought from the beginning to the end. Uh, that was just a, uh, a total team effort. Um, total coaching staff effort, uh, right down to the troopers, to the bus drivers, man. It was just a, uh, a collab. And, and once it got close, uh, no one wavered. You know, coach told them uh, in pregame, you know, adversity is going to hit. 
uh, regardless. At some point in time, adversity is going to hit. And you hear that all the time. Uh, but when you really see it and you feel it, you know, you're like, wow, it's just like momentum. That's a real thing. You know, people may not think that's a real thing, but that's a real thing, just like adversity. And uh, it hit. Kids didn't waver, man. You know, they dug in even deeper, dug even deeper and uh, did not realize what had happened as far as the the 16 and 0 versus the conference until after the game. And that's when, you know, the I don't want to say celebration, but that's when the, you know, the hugs, the high fives amongst the, the guys in the college shirt. You know, that's when that started. Uh, the kids were happy from the beginning uh, because they saw, you know, that they can do this. You know, we we we, we were still a, a heck of a rally from a very good team and uh, being nice on, on their field. Uh, for the first time in I don't know how many years that they had a home game. Yeah. Um, so, and it was a very live and uh, uh, jubilant, however you want to put it, 11,000 folks there. Um, and it got loud at times. And, uh, you know, we needed that going into conference play. And, uh, man, the kids just, uh, they faced it, stared it down, and we came out victorious. Hey, man, congratulations on that win. I know that was a big one. A lot of people across the SWAC were really, really rooting for you guys, especially because a lot of people, including myself, feel like this team should be 2-1 and one after after what happened week one, man. That that one still hurts. Me and G talked about that the other day. But in case you guys missed it, I will be back in Mormon coming down for the Soul Bowl November 19th, Jackson State at Alcorn. So I will be back in Mormon. And I had to experience the atmosphere for not only a SWAC game, but without the rain delay. The crowd was there, and then we, we, you know, we got pushed back to like one o'clock in the morning. Man, that was a long night. I know you agree with me on that one. Unbelievable, you know. But we <laughs> had before, man. Um, we we've had that before, and this one here may have been the second longest. Um, yeah. But you know, it, it it happens, and you're right, man. We uh, we had to quickly try to put that one behind us because it was it was there. It was there for taking. Absolutely. But guys, the way a lot of these episodes will work, and we're going to recap about three, four games and then preview about three, four games each week. Uh, we're not going to be exclusive just to the swag because um, as me and coach talked about, sometimes there's a little bit of a conflict of interest, you know, with game planning and, and, and things like that. So we're going to try to keep it across the board, even do some FBS games that come along this season that are huge. But coach, let's start out with a, with the only ranked versus ranked FCS matchup of the weekend. Delaware putting on a huge performance against Rhode Island, man. They went out there and put it on them. I believe they scored 35 first half points, 28 in the second quarter. And guys, the way we're going to do this, I'm going to give my analyst view. Coach, of course, is going to give you the, the, the coach's view, which is why this show is going to be really, really special. So coach, just from your perspective, looking at this game, doing, doing a little bit of research, what did you see in this game that made all the difference for Delaware pulling out this big win? Delaware, uh, they, they put the pedal to the metal and they didn't let up um, no matter, you know, the first half uh, they raced out to a big lead and uh, they continue to, to do that. Uh, if you go back, like you said, and you look at the numbers, uh, one thing that's very big and, and we'll talk about pretty much every episode is the third down uh, conversions and the very few that they had, they were able to stay on the field. And as a offensive football team, that's what you want to do when you do get – because third downs are going to come. Um, you want them to first be manageable, and then you want to be able to handle them once they do present themselves. And that's what they did. Uh, and those kids, man, to the coach's credit, man, they played hard as if they didn't have any points in the first half. Uh, if you go back and you look at just coming, some of the highlights and uh, you know the time of possession uh, really doesn't do it justice. I think people get fooled when you, I mean, you look, they put up over 600 yards of total offense. And when you look at Nolan Henderson's performance, he was a player of the week this week, threw for almost 400 yards. They dominated time of possession for how much they threw the ball. I mean, they won that by over 10 minutes, but they really dedicated themselves to running the football. Even though they threw it 34 times, they still had almost 50 rushing attempts. And I think that's important for a team. because, I, Coach, I know you've seen it where a team gets up big, their inability to run the football consistently and effectively cost them in the second half because that defense starts being out on the field way too long, and that's when you see them come back start. So I think you've got to give Delaware a lot of props. Even though they did go a little bit more conservative in the second half, they were still able to effectively run the football and pretty much put this game away in the second half. A lot of timely runs. A lot of timely runs. Um, and then you talk about the quarterback's numbers. 
um, that's tough to do on air. You know, that's tough to do on air. Um, and when you have those type of days where it's clicking that way and your defense is playing and you start to race out to 7 nothing, 14 nothing, 21 nothing, you best believe on that other sideline that, that, that break in case of emergency – you know, we, we're pulling that out. I don't know if you remember that when you were in school where they had that fire yeah. uh, alarm and they had the glass and said, break in case of emergency. Once it gets to 21 nothing, and it's you're not out of the first quarter, man, You it, it, it takes everything for you not to do it, but it's tough not to do it because now you're starting to see points. You're chasing points. Time of possession is going away from you because you feel like you have to throw the ball every down to catch up. Um and there's no there's no answer for 21 nothing. There's no answers answers for 28. Definitely no answers for 35 nothing. It's got to be a play at a time. But when when Delaware is putting that pressure on you, uh, the way they are, like you said, they're throwing it effectively, and then they're running it at a decent chunk. Uh, and that time is rolling, man. So every possession you get on the other sideline becomes really valuable, really valuable. And Delaware just continued to add that pressure, man. Yeah, they've, they've been extremely impressive. They got an FBS win on the resume. They beat Navy week one, and now they get a top 20 win to add to their playoff resume. The one concern I do have, though, is the penalties. I don't know if it just kind of got out of hand because they were up so big and it didn't really cost them, but 11 penalties for over 100 yards when you get into CAA, deep into CAA play, that's going to cost you against the Villanovas and into those FCS playoffs. So that's the only thing I would look at Delaware this weekend and say that's something they got to clean up going into conference play throughout this season. And, and as a coach, that's something that we circle. Uh, because like you said, even though the score ended up being what it did, uh, let's say that that Rhode Island's ever able to put up 14 more points somewhere in between there. And now you're in that four minute ball game that we as coaches talk about those uh, false starts, those holding penalties, that take you from first and 10 to, to first and 20, um, you know, those personal files, you know, those things that put you not just behind the chains, but way behind the chains uh, becomes a part of the game now. And if you run into, like you said, tougher competition on, on any given day, man, those penalties, man, uh, they make it hard. They make it hard. And as a coach, man, there's no one call, man, for third and 18. You know, that's, <laughs> that's a tough one to get, especially when you got to stay on the field. Absolutely. And moving to the next game, you know, this was a big weekend for HBCU football, I feel like, in terms of out-of-conference wins. You guys get a huge win over McNeese, and then these next two games were signature victories for the MEAC out-of-conference. And these were games that neither of them were picked to have a chance in. You had one team going up against a two- or three-time now back-to-back -back defending NEC champion and one of the top CAA teams in the, in the country, number 25 in the country, New Hampshire. Let's start with the New Hampshire-North Carolina Central game. This was a huge win for head coach Trey Oliver and this squad. Coach, looking back at this game, what, what were the biggest keys you think to Central pulling off this upset, which they were 13-point underdogs, I believe, going into this game? Again, like the first game, um, you know, Coach Oliver, again, hats, hats off to him and his program um, coming from where they've come from in a short span of time uh, to pull this off, man. That's big time. But they were able to get those timely uh, first downs out of those third down situations to stay on the field, uh, to continue to eat that clock up. Uh, you know, when you can do that as the underdog, that just gives your team a shot in the arm, man, when you can hand that ball off on third and seven and rip off a 15 yard run. It does something to your team and it definitely does something to the other team. And they had those situations happen at timely parts of the game that allowed them to put the pressure on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, the opponents. And I think you got to give them credit just because, you know, you just talked about staying in third and short's important, especially when you can run the ball. And I think, Davis Richards' ability to be dynamic outside the pocket, it's almost impossible to stop a team that has a quarterback that is a playmaker in third and shorts. If it's third and three or less and my quarterback can run the football, the playbook opens up so much more because I'm not scared to pass it because if things break down, I trust him to go get it. Yep, he can get you out of it. Um, and we faced that young man um, to open the week zero uh, a season ago, and he was able to do that to us, you know, when it got time that we needed to have a stop, man. He was able to get outside the pocket and make it happen just enough, you know, third and 10, and he would get 
third and ten and a half. You know, he would just get that much, and it was effective. And uh, to see him grow from when we first saw him uh, week zero a, a season ago uh, to now, to know where he started from the first year of Coach Oliver, uh, Coach Leone, uh, those guys are, you know, doing a great job, man. And they, uh, they're, they're up and coming. They're up and coming. He's taken, I think, uh, you know, Shador's taken, taken a big step forward. But I think out of all the quarterbacks that were in HBC football last year, I think Richard might've taken the biggest jump just in terms of his efficiency. And I think he has um, also, like you said, in terms of efficiency, but also he doesn't not, and, and I don't want to come off or, or say this the wrong way, but he doesn't have, the the weapon tree that say that you know mr sanders has right um, doesn't have those household names he's just basically to me he's making everybody around him better um he's delivering the football to where those guys need it and it doesn't hurt like you said when he can turn around and hand it to uh any one of those guys because they have two backs that have decent numbers uh and they take the burden off of him and you know that that makes teams have to make a decision. And I think this is what one of the issues was in this game. How do we play it? Do we load the box or do we play the pass? And uh, again, once you get up a couple scores like they did, man, it, it puts real, real pressure on your opponent. And just for people listening that can't, you know, didn't see the stats, man, North Carolina Central went 12 for 15 on third downs. That's that is a ridiculous percentage and also coming into the game, you know, I, I, I picked central to, for the upset on this one, but my biggest concern for new Hampshire was they, they did a great job running the football. The first few weeks lob their running back was, was averaging like six yards per carry had five rushing touchdowns in two games and they ran the football and the front seven for North Carolina central on the defense side of the football played outstanding man held them to 2.8 yards per carry only 65 yards rushing. And, they shut it down, and when you're so efficient where you have 200 passing and 200 rushing and you can do it through the air and on the ground, man, New Hampshire stood no chance being as one-dimensional as they were, even as talented as their quarterback is. Yeah, but when you face that and every football, every offensive coach talks about being balanced, and you think about it, uh, even if you're playing a video game, man, it's tough to be balanced. It's tough to keep up with those numbers, how many runs we have compared to how many passes we have. Uh, and it's all predicated on what that scoreboard says, you know, and to just have that type of balance, man, is just, you know, incredible. Uh, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see um, as they go on and start to get into league play, uh, how they try to keep that going and if they're able to keep that going. Uh, we'll see that they get, they get a, you know, they have a D two matchup this weekend, but then they break into they, that. They have one more at a conference game next weekend that I'll be at. They got to travel to Campbell. That's going to be a huge test for central. Yes. But go into the next game, a defensive struggle for the most part, but for a lot of this game, it, it was a close low scoring game till Morgan broke this one open, but Morgan state first year head coach, Damon Wilson comes in. 24 to 9 over the defending NEC champions that have been in the playoffs for three consecutive seasons were unanimously picked to win the NEC again, get to the playoffs. I don't think I could say enough about the coach, coach, the, the coaching job that Coach Wilson's done year one at Morgan. That and they have been way ahead of schedule, way in my ahead. opinion. Way ahead. And you think about when he got there, um, and the direction uh, or, or how they were gonna go uh before Coach uh Wheatley uh departed. And, and then you throw, you know, coach in that situation. And it's just one of those deals where you got to move very quick. You know, you got to move quick. You got to get everybody on board with, with your vision. And uh, I think this win here does nothing but just adds, you know, uh, more firepower to, to him and getting those kids to, uh, to buy in to what it is he's trying to do there. And, and when you do it versus, you know, a sacred heart, I mean, that's got to be huge, you know. That's got to be huge for him. And especially, I mean, so for people who don't know, Sacred Heart came in with a unanimous FCS All-American running back who's the defending offensive player of the year in the conference, and they absolutely shut down Sacred Heart in terms of the run game. Only 60 total yards allowed. And when you go and look at when, when you go look at Malik Grant had 11 attempts for 20 yards. That's 1.2 yards per carry for a guy who led who was one of the 
top five rushers in the country last season. The defensive play was 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 elite this weekend for Morgan State. I, I feel safe to say using that word elite, holding Sacred Heart's rushing game to sixty total yards. I mean, and then you talk about the fact that they were able to to basically make them one dimensional. Um, and when you're able to make a team one dimensional, man, that that allows you as a defense to to pin your ears back and 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 either put apply more pressure or sit back and wait on them to make that mistake because they're going to press uh, because you know you you're steadily pulling off and that clock is is, is ticking and and now we're one dimensional we have one of the best weapons in the country and we can't use them uh, we never plan for that you know I don't care what anybody says you never plan for that <laughs> um, so that happened on the fly and uh, you know Morgan was able to to not only you know dominate in that area. But the penalty battle, you know, again, like you said in the first game, you know, you're talking about a deal of where Morgan ends up and, and, and they, they control that area. And then Sacred Heart was almost like every time they moved it uh, and got some momentum, something happened. Um, and I told you in the beginning, momentum is real. You know, it's it's real. You think you just ripped off a third and 15 and then you look behind you and you see that old yellow yellow laundry on the field, man, that thing, it, it becomes disheartening. <laughs> it becomes disheartening. And then the other thing about it, turnovers. You know, mm-hmm. the turnover battle, Morgan was able to win that. And if you win the turnover battle, I would say nine out of ten times, man, you're going to win it. You're going to win that ball game if you can win that turnover battle. Especially when you look at the the worst, the worst one is Morgan gets to the red zone five times, comes away with points on four of those. Sacred Heart 0 for 2. And red zone opportunities and in a low scoring ball game, you know, I mean, you've been there where it's, you know, one touchdown can break things open. And if you're not converting on these red zone opportunities, when it's this game, you know, was like 10 to nine and a touchdown changes everything for sacred heart. And the fact they can't punch it in and they were zero for five on fourth down attempts too, yes. it, it, it is demoralizing and it takes the air out of your team. You got to have it. And, and, you know, it's one of those things to kind of go back to, uh, when you get down there, of course, everybody says it. You want to score touchdowns. E- of course, you want to score touchdowns. But you can't come away with nothing. You know, three is better than uh, the other team running off happy because they turned it over first down the other way. You know, you got to get points in those situations. And like you said, especially when it's a low-scoring game and uh, you know every point is going to count. You know, you got to be able to turn those trips inside the red zone into points. You know, that that's just football one on one. You got to be able to turn them into points. And, and you, uh, before we move on to this week's games, the last question I have you kind of a little touched on a little bit, but what is the mindset and and what is the feeling as a coaching staff where you have an FCS All American running back? Everyone knows that's your strategy. You he has to run the football, and nothing you do works. I mean. What, going into halftime for Sacred Heart, what do you think the conversation was like? And have you been in that situation where you have an All American, you have the guy, and he just is not having a good day? What is it? What is that like as a coaching staff? I think, um, and and I'm speaking for them in their situation because it was still fairly close. Um, so you know they don't, you don't want to abandon it just com, you know completely because he is who he is, you know, and you know at any point in time, man, he can touch it, make something happen. Uh, and, and, and hit a home run for you. But also in your back, you know, in the back of your mind, how do we play off of this? We, we got to start to play off of it because everybody in the stadium knows we're trying to get the ball to him. Uh, now we've got to play off of it. And now other guys have got to raise their level uh, to get us to a point to where we can get back to our regular game plan. Uh, but when you shut that water off right there, now, now we want to see – Who's going to be able to do their thing uh, when it gets really tight? You know, everybody talks about it in the locker room. I'm the guy. I'm the guy. But when you have the opportunity to be the guy, you know, you've got to put up, you know, put up a shut up. And uh, when Morgan cut that water off, man, it, it, it got tight, I'm sure, for the guys in the college shirt as well as the players because they know this is our guy. And if our guy's not doing anything or not able to do something – now that that doubt starts to seep in their mind, like, well, maybe this is not our day, you know, one of those deals. Yeah. And you don't want to continue to force feed it, you know, beating your head against the brick wall. But then, like I said, in the back of your mind, man, you know what you have, you know how special that guy is. But as that score starts to creep away from you, now we've got to come up with something else. 
Yeah, I and I can only ima only imagine, man. You know, sitting in that locker room, being like, man, this this guy is supposed to be able to run on everybody, and they are just not allowing this, man. So great win from Morgan, though, uh, an amazing win for for uh, North Carolina Central and Delaware. Some great games, but. We got a loaded slate this weekend, man. You know, conference plays opening Ooh. up across the country. We got top top 10 matchups, top 15 matchups, top 20 matchups, huge conference matchups. So, you know, guys, uh, we can't cover every game. And listen, Coach has a schedule. He can't be on here all night. So we're just going to pick three, four games each week to preview across the country. Let's start out. Let's let's work up to the game of the week. We'll start at the bottom here, man. South Carolina State versus North Carolina a &T. This is... A former MEAC matchup. There's a lot of a lot of emotions coming with this one. And both of these teams, especially AT, are coming in looking for a win. 0 and 3 right now. They've had a brutal schedule, by the way. Yes. Central, North Dakota State on the road. Uh, I, play, I believe they played Duke last weekend. And then South Carolina State, of course, opening up with UCF, got a big win against Bethune Cookman this year. Going into this game, coach, what are some keys that you have seen from each of these teams that they're gonna have to achieve this weekend to win this game? It, it, again, man, you can't harp on it enough. Uh, you're talking about six for 27, and, and you had a uh, you had an FBS game in there, six for 27 on third downs for uh, uh, SC. And then when you talk about the the central part of it, I mean the A and T part of it, uh, they are a little bit better, you know, but. It all comes down to can you convert? Can you keep the other player, other team's best player off the field? And we know who the marquee guy is. Uh, and NCAT's got a, they've got a, a, a hill they've got to climb and they've got to decide what they want to do. Do we want to take Shaq out of this thing and we'll deal with the run game later? Or do we know, okay, he's going to probably get his, but we got to cut everything else off? Uh, third downs and who can score points quickly and put pressure on everybody else. That's the main thing you're talking about 21 points a game uh, versus uh, 12 points a game. And, 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 and NCAS had a brutal schedule, like you said, no doubt about it, but can they put points up early enough to stay close? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I feel like both of these teams still have a lot of question marks for me. And it that's the tough part about FCS football early in the season because there's some teams that they play all their tough FBS games and overpower games early. And it's like going into week four, I, I got more question marks than I do answers, even then coming in from the preseason. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, right. And then for me, the quarterback battle is going to really determine this one. Both teams run the ball efficiently. K Kendrell Flowers is legit. For South Carolina State and Tootin has been for losing Jermaine Martin, he has looked amazing stepping yep. into that running back one role. And I think even against Duke and North Dakota State, he he found room to get out there. He has over almost 300 yards rushing this year. But Corey Fields and Zach Yeager are going to be the battle to watch. Both of them have struggled with efficiency, completion percentage, and just commanding the overall offense. It's going to come down to me. Who is who is able to make the least amount of mistakes at the quarterback spot? And is anyone going to take this game there? And that's going to be my biggest question mark. And one of those guys has a, a legitimate NFL prospect out wide. Yep. Um, that helps your accuracy a lot. <laughs> you just get it in the area and uh, he makes plays for you. Um, my, 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 my deal that I want to see is what Coach Washington – and his crew comes up with. Um, are you going to take the chance of letting this guy beat you? Or are you going to make them have to do something else during the week to beat you? Um, and I think, like you said, with the quarterback situation, if you force uh, SC to stay, uh, to stay in rhythm to where they've got to drive the football, will he make the mistake? Yeah. You know, um, he can throw it up and they can also that they have the ability to one hit quit. Ain't no doubt. But can you drive the football SC consistently and get and get points out of it? Uh, so it'd be interesting to see what coach Washington and, and his staff comes up with on, um, on their defensive game plan. And like you said, in their backfield, uh, they just keep producing running backs who run the ball hard uh, from Tyreek, uh, to uh, last year's guy, to this year's guy, 
and they all look the same. Uh, not quite as far, you know, fast as Tyreek, but they all look the same type of back, you know. Um, and when you can run the ball, uh, you control the clock. You can control the clock. Uh, so we'll see what Coach uh, Coach Washington. That's 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 the game that I want to see how they uh, how they approach it. And like you said, the film that they got is from a very tough schedule. So do we really know who the real Incat is? You know, uh, yeah. watching film. How do you gauge what happened versus Duke? How do you gauge what versus happened a, a, a good Dakota State team? You know, uh, what emphasis do you carry over and what do you dismiss because, hey, that was Duke? You know, so it, it'll be an interesting battle. Interesting battle. And uh, the offensive line for North Carolina A&T is going to have to show up this weekend because you mentioned the NFL prospect at the wide receiver spot. Jablonski Green is no joke at the defensive end spot, and they still got Godbolt at defensive tackle. And let's not forget about B.J. Davis at the linebacker spot. They got some dogs in the front seven. Yes, and that's going to be, like you said, that that's going to be interesting. Is he going to really have it to where snap, get rid of it? He's going to have time to find Shaq other than the go ball. Uh, are they going to be able to run the ball to take the pressure uh, off of that? off of that, you know, front four, uh, front five up there blocking. Because uh, if they can run the ball, then that makes things a lot, you know, life a lot easier. Uh, if they can't run the ball, it's going to be a uh, it's going to be a tough one, I think. Oh, yeah. So uh, I got to ask you, do you want to make a prediction? Do you got a prediction on who comes out ahead on this one? Man, I just I'm I'm a receiver guy. Um, Coach Washington is a Tampa guy. He's a Florida boy. Uh I just like man that kid, that kid Davis Shack man he he won me over uh, last <laughs> year during December just watching him, uh, and not only was he just the clearly the best player on the field, he was having fun with it, and uh, that makes you know me a big fan for him and and with that being said, uh, I think it's low score, but I, I like SC uh, just because just because. I, I like it, Coach. I like it, guys. I'll be making my predictions on the website, man. That, uh, all these games I'm putting on the website, too. But I'll let y'all know I am leaning with Coach here. I, I think I think at uh, South Carolina State right now I would be my prediction. I just think that front seven is going to be too much. I think they can slow the run game down and put this game on Gager, similar to how Central did. Things could get extremely interesting. But, Coach, our sole swag matchup this week, I don't think you guys have either of the, either of these teams on your all schedule this year. So it's going to be an interesting matchup to see. But both are coming in really needing a win. FAMU sitting at one and two losses to UNC and Jackson State with that win over Albany State and AM. Talk about a brutal opening. UAB, Troy, and then you got a ranked Austin P team that came in and they played them close early. That thing got away that that thing got away from them late, but what are you looking for in this matchup between FAMU and Alabama A&M this, this weekend down in Bragg? Coach, this one here is uh, – this one is really interesting uh, because this one right here, the winner turns that volume down just a little bit. The loser, that volume gets cranked all the way up. Uh, both of these programs had real high expectations coming into the, uh, into the year, uh, way back in the spring. Uh, signing period, those type of things. Uh, the hype that came with it uh, put a huge, huge, huge bullseye on both of these guys' backs, I think. Um, and Fam probably, uh, with that situation uh, that we all know about, uh, had a great showing that first week. And then that second week, they go to Miami, and I think it finally caught up with them, uh, you know, emotionally. I think it finally caught up with them. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see from their standpoint how their quarterback situation pans out, um, if they're able to get their defense cranked up, and it's going to be a deal of where how much pressure are these guys feeling? Because basically loser can, loser can pretty much say that they are out of the East race. You know, yeah. uh, I, I just think, you know, the loser is out of the East race. I could be wrong. Stranger things have happened. But I don't think you win the East with three losses. Uh, it's going to be tough for you to win the East with two losses. Um, as we saw last year, it was tough to win the East with one loss. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so A&M's got questions. Uh, quarterback, 
Um, defensively, health-wise, I don't know how good they are. Uh, I know they had guys banged up from what I hear. Uh, can they put it together enough to uh, to get a win? And like I said, man, this is a game where the winner can quiet some folks. The loser is going to hear it. It's going to hear it, you know. Yeah. So I, I, I expect a hard-fought game. Um, who can control the mistakes? Who can keep from pressing the most uh, is going to be very important here. Yeah, it, no, for me, I think the defensive line battle is going to be interesting. As a lot of people have been very loud and critical of Isaiah Land this year. He missed the first game and didn't necessarily perform great against Jackson State nor Albany State. And then on the other side, you have Zarion Hayes, a transfer from Appalachian State that has really emerged as a bona fide pass rusher for AM this season, has played extremely well these first three weeks of the season. And the question does become, you know, did, how much did that bye week help FAMU? Do they have a chance to reset the locker room? And you know as a coach, it's tough. You've been dealing with off-the-field issues. You've been dealing with media noise. You came off a, a devastating conference loss in a game that, let's be honest, they went in there thinking they had a chance to, to yes. win that game against Jackson, and they put 59 on you, and it was a, it was not a great showing. So my question is, and I love Willie Simmons as a coach, was he able to reset the players' mindset in the locker room? Because you, cause you know how easy it is, Coach. You, you can lose some players. It's easy to get distracted when you're sitting at one and two and you feel like you might not have a chance to go win a conference championship. Right, and, you know, I worked with uh, Coach Simmons uh, 2014, um, we won the uh, we won the conference and was able to to win the uh, HBCU national championship together while working together. Um, and I I fully uh, believe and trust that he will have those guys back. Um, but the thing that we as coaches, you know, the guys in the college shirt have a tough time controlling. Uh, what are those guys hearing on the outside? The outside noise. How much attention are they paying to it? Um, and that's, I think, has been one of their major issues um, since the story broke. You know, um, the bye week could have worked one or two ways. It could have helped them get some things fixed to where the morale is now back to where it needs to be. Or it could have gave them just more time to look around and said nothing's been taken care of and we're right back to rock bottom. Um, and that's 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 going to be the telltale if you remember last year they played, it came down to a uh, to a play. Uh, yeah, a late play, a late very play. late play, because um, I think A&M was up by like 20-something points, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. And they had to run them down. You know, they had to run them down, and then they had to have that spectacular play uh, by one of the Yak boys uh, in the end zone yeah. for the touchdown. Um, so now A&M is basically a brand-new team from last year. Every year is a new team, definitely that. Uh, but now you don't have that big quarterback back there standing on that mound for you. Um, now you have questions on your offense, so to speak. Um, who's going to be able to control their emotions and who was able to control the turnover situation and who's going to be able to capitalize on those mistakes when they happen? Yeah, the quarterback, the quarterback play and the offensive line for AM are really going to dictate how how much how, how competitive this game is. I think right now Lakeford and Casey have combined for about just over 500 yards, seven interceptions, and no touchdowns. And they've been sacked 12 times. And that is so hard as a quarterback to deal with when you know it's not going well. And every time you get back there, you're under pressure. It's really, really hard to kind of center yourself in the pocket. Well, your eyes start moving. Uh, now you're trying to figure out, let me check this. Now get my eyes back to where they need to be. Um, and, and that's tough. Uh, let me ask you this question. Um, if the team that showed up at North Carolina with the added pieces, how would you be feeling about fam at this point? I would feel a lot better when I look at you know when I look at that division. There's question marks all up and down the board. You got question marks with Valley. You have question marks with with Alabama A and M. Alabama State has quarterback health problems. We don't know when D Davis is coming back or what that team's going to look like um, moving forward. You have questions about Bethune Cookman coming off a loss to South Carolina State. I mean, there's question marks everywhere so if FAMU goes out here and looks like they did against UNC where Moose is efficient Xavier Smith's able to get off that defensive line plays well the secondary is able to force some turnovers 
I mean, I think you can make a strong argument that FAMU potentially, depending on, you know, what Southern looks like moving down the line to, that's a big game for them in early November, that they potentially can make another run here where they finish with only two losses and it's to Jackson State and their FBS opponent, just like they did last year, especially if Musa comes out and looks just like he did week one. That's that's the key, I think. Um, and then you add the pieces that w- that didn't get to play in NC in, in UNC. Um, and I think that was the outside noise because the expectation when they went to Miami uh, was high. You know, we got these guys back. We played a great game in North Carolina. Um, and then, like you said, not just a, sly, a, a slice, but then you get basically a whole pie of humbleness. Uh, yeah. Can they bounce back? You know, that's going to be the big deal. Can they bounce back? Uh, and how quick do they bounce back? And can A&M, if A&M gets up just a smidget, uh, what that te- what, is, what is the team going to do? I mean, how are they going to respond? And playing this one in Bragg is a big deal for FAMU because that's a tough place to go down at 5 p.m. That crowd's going to be ready for a conference game. It's their first SWAT game of the year. It's going to be tough for AM to go down there and get a win. Do you have – who are you leaning toward in this matchup, Coach? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning toward Coach Simmons, uh, not only because I work, you know, work with him <laughs> um, and, I, and I know, you know, he's more than capable to get those guys off the mat. But, you know, you're talking about a home game in Tallahassee uh, first one of the year, uh, you're liable to have anywhere from 12 to uh, 25,000 folks there uh, in green and orange. And that that counts, you know, a, a lot. That, that, that figures into the situation a lot. And I think if they get off to a quick start, you know, Tallahassee could be, uh, could be rocking and uh, A&M would be in trouble quick. So I'm, I'm going to go with FAM in this situation. I like it, Coach. I like it. And then, you know, our two um, non-HBC matchups here. Our first one, a top 20 matchup between Eastern Washington, Montana State. Montana State having to go up to the red turf. A really, really tough place to win a game up there in Cheney, Washington. Um, both of these teams coming off of FBS losses. Well, Eastern Washington's coming off a of bye week, but they got beat the week before by Oregon. Oregon State. 68-28 over Montana State last weekend. Coach, what, what, what was your first impressions of this game, you know, looking at both of these teams so far throughout 2022? Man, they uh, they both took uh, took beatings, like you said, from the FBS. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, a smooth 70-piece, and the other one, a, a extra crispy 68-piece. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, you know, one has played three games, one has played two. Uh, how healthy is the team that played three? Um, and what is the mindset of the team that played two? Uh, because it's a, uh, it's a different ball game when you are, you know, in Oregon. Uh, that's, a, that's a tough place to play. Uh, now you're talking about meeting a Montana State team who uh, is averaging 44 a game, you know, and you're looking at an Eastern Washington team that's averaging 25. Uh, so there's a sliding scale there. Uh, they both took the L from their FBS matchups. Uh, how do you compare the Tennessee State win to the the Moorhead and the McNeese? Uh, where did that? Where does that fall in? And who's going to be able to get off again to the fast start? Uh, I think Montana plays at a different speed uh, because I think though that program is now. Uh, right at the edge of getting ready to challenge for, you know, the Dakotas for, for that, uh, that, that bid to get to Texas and play in that game. Uh, you know, I got a chance to watch them and they play fast. Uh, and they, they got some guys that can go get it. And the quarterback is, uh, is a really good player. And you know, and I know if you got good quarterback play, you got a chance in every game you play. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how they make up the difference, uh, 44 points a game to 25 points a game. It's going to be it's gonna be an interesting game, I think. Yeah, I mean, just to note for the injury, uh, Montana State's top three running backs are all out this game. Yeah, uh, ex- did not. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I reached out to my, 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 my Montana State um, insider. I got a little bit of connections up there, and that does include Isaiah Afonzi, consensus first team All-American, will probably be out to almost November. Now was Jahari, uh, did they move him back? That was a big move for them last year. He gave them some, inter- you know, some good minutes there uh, in the backfield. 
but that almost makes them one dimensional and they have two receivers that can go get it. Uh, yeah. But uh, again, like we talked about earlier, when you have, when you make a team one dimensional, uh, it becomes a tough, tough sledding for that team. And uh, I'm, I'm stretching out what I had as my prediction. Now you just told me that that's, gonna be, <laughs> that's going to be tough. That's going to be tough. It's, it- it's brutal, man, because um, you know, just to put it in perspective for people, the top two leading rushers for Montana State are two quarterbacks. Um, Tommy Malott and Chambers have combined for over 300, almost 400 yards and eight touchdowns together. So the leading rusher at the running back spot has 176 yards being Sumner, and he's one of the running backs that I got told couldn't play this week. So the you're looking at Elliott being the number one running back, and he has seven carries this year so far. And you're talking about a top ten matchup, you know? That's yeah, a question in itself, you know, a huge question. question. And 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 you know, Malat has has played well. Tommy Malat, of course, came in last year. So Montana State was in a weird spot. They 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 make the playoffs last year. Their quarterback, uh, who now is the quarterback for Elon, transfers before their first round playoff game. Tommy Malott steps in as a freshman and leads them to the national championship. So the expectations are high for him, but my biggest question mark is he's been a bit turnover prone this year. Three interceptions already to only four passing touchdowns has not been super efficient through the air. And the, the experience is in the secondary of Eastern Washington. They can, they can force some turnovers. You saw that Tennessee State game. They forced some crucial turnovers to win that game, including a late pick um, of Draylon Ellis to seal that game. And, my question is, can Gunnar Talkington, his first year starting, he's set behind Eric Berrier. Everyone on this show knows how special Eric Berrier was. He gets his moment finally, already has 400 yards in two games, seven touchdowns, only two picks, almost 100 rushing yards. Can Talkington do this against a very, very talented Montana State defense that I will say had to replace some big pieces? Troy Anderson gone, Daniel Hardy gone, Amandre Williams gone from that front seven. I think right now you have to look at these teams have some major question marks, and that is the that is the um, I would I would say the question mark of the century is man, can we take anything away from Oregon State Oregon game, or do we have to look at those like you said McNeese Morehead State and Tennessee State games? And let's be honest, Morehead State's probably not on the level of Montana State. I don't know how how much you could take from that game, being that they're non scholarship, you know, playing the defending you know second place team in the country last year. And that, and it goes back to like you said earlier, um, it's tough in the beginning because everybody's playing those non-conference games. Um, and my thing would be, I from from past history, I would go out on a limb and say that Oregon is a lot better than Oregon State. You know, yeah. Uh, so then you start trying to take that matchup, and and they both, like I said, neither one had a good showing versus either one of those teams. Um, and then the only thing that you can kind of halfway try and even up would be the McNeese, the Tennessee State thing. Um, and then I think you just factor in location. Uh, that's a tough place to play, right? I mean, yeah. on that on that red deal, um, and now you're talking about bringing in youth, uh, man, that can be a, a deciding factor is where this game is being played. Yeah, and Robert, I want to remind people, that wide receiving core for Eastern Washington is no joke. Robertson was an FCS All-American. Chisholm is there at the wide receiver spot, amazing slot guy. Ulm and James are are, are absolute studs. I mean, listen, these guys can ball out. So, Coach, who are you leaning toward in this this top 15 matchup? And this could shake up a lot of rankings if Eastern Washington can pull off this upset. And I I had to stretch it out because I was going to give uh, Montana State the edge uh, just because I saw those guys and and they were playing, you know, tremendous at the time. But now uh, when you give me that, that changes it because I thought they had enough to override being on the road. Uh, yeah. And they, uh, you know, when you're playing with confidence the way they were playing, uh, even though they took it on the chin with their FBS deal, they were still playing with a lot of confidence. Um, you know, you could just see them move around. You could see in the way they were playing. Uh, I got to stretch it. I got to go with the home team. Uh, Love it. Upset city. Yeah. Yeah. Got to go with the home team. Got to go with the home team. 
Oh, man, Eastern Washington is going to experience a big jump if they can pull this one off. And then there's a lot of question marks. A lot of the pollsters right now had dropped Montana State, and a lot of their polls, there's been a lot of question marks due to the injuries, like you said, where they don't know what it's going to be. Isaiah Fonzi was the heart and soul of this team, was the leading rusher in the country last season. And so a lot of question marks. But a game of the week, listen, when you have a top six matchup, it's got to be the game of the week, especially in a big conference game like this. you got South Dakota State, Missouri State, both of these teams only lost, Coach, were competitive FBS games. South Dakota State loses to Iowa 7-3 to three week one, does not allow a touchdown. The seven came from two safeties and a field goal. Something and last <laughs> – you love it. As an offensive guy, you got to love it. And then Missouri State took Arkansas to the brink last week, lost a, lost a one-score game, single-digit um, last week at Arkansas, on the road, a top-10 FBS team, and they they put on a showing. So what, what what's your thoughts on this game going into this weekend? Again, they sit both sit at about 30, uh, 40% on third downs. Um, they both uh, took, you know, like you said, their, their money games to the wire. Um, and then the – I think the deciding factor here is that Dakota State has been there consistently. Um, and I think Missouri State's kind of feeling their way. Uh, although although uh, their coach has been there, uh, done that a time or two as well. So I'm sure he will have them ready to go uh, because this is a huge matchup, uh, not just the numbers, but this is a huge matchup for that program. Um, and I think it's a huge matchup for him uh, just from the coach talk. I, I think if he pulls this off and they're able to make noise, um, despite all that has happened, somebody's going to come call and, and he'll get an opportunity to get back up to that level uh, of play where he came from. Um, and I think he will have those guys ready to go. And, uh, you know, how good was Iowa? How, how good is Iowa? You know? Um, yeah. Yeah. We all know Arkansas uh, has been on the rise. Uh, they're trending. Uh, as they say, they're trending up. But how good is Iowa? Um, and I guess we'll see that as they go along in league play as well because they had a chance to win that. And about an opportunity to uh, hit a stepping stone like this. I think, uh, I think both programs, it, it means a lot, but – one and one coach, I think it means more too, uh, to be able to pull this off and show everybody that we are, we, we're here at that level, at this level as the, you know, uh, as these guys are. Yeah, I mean, uh, on one side you have, uh, you know, in, in terms of pure talent, maybe the the most explosive quarterback in the FCS and Jason Shelley for for Missouri State. I mean, he is. He has been electric. He was electric last week. He was great, you know, coming into – and everyone knows the Petrino offense. If you're an athletic quarterback, it's your time it. to go eat. Yeah. And and he's done that, man. No turnovers thus far through the air. Seven touchdowns, almost 1,000 yards passing already. And the one question mark, though, Missouri State's offensive line is a huge question mark for me going up against a very, very physical South Dakota State defense. 17 sacks in three games allowed against a quarterback that can move in the pocket. That's hard to do. And that's that goes back to we we all know Arkansas is trending. Um, how good is UT Martin up front? And how good is, you know, U, U, UCA? Uh, how good are those guys on defense when you're talking about, like you said, defense and a, 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 an athletic quarterback and he's still hitting the ground? Um how much better are those programs or where do they stand next to a Dakota State up front defensively? You know? I think, yeah, I think right now, I mean, re- you know, based on what I've seen this season, I think in terms of FCS defensive lines, this is probably the best front seven that Missouri State is probably going to see this season at the FCS level because they don't see North Dakota State this year. They could be in trouble. Uh, yeah. he, he could definitely be in trouble. And like you said, a, uh, a Petrino offense is not going to be a deal of where – He'll be a sitting duck. He's going to have to run. He's going to have to move. Um, but are they going to be able to control him in the pocket to get him on the ground? And will he become antsy? And those turnovers start to, to you know, pile up because he doesn't have any. Uh, yeah. I just, you know, this is going to be huge, man. This is going to be huge. Yeah. We're talking early in the season. 
Oh yeah, I mean, for this matchup to be Week Four is is brutal for both of these teams, especially you know, with, especially for Missouri State coming off of an FBS, an emotional FBS game where the starters didn't get to sit. You know, they weren't getting blown out, and Jason Shelley played two quarters. They played up until the last snap, and South Dakota State's coming off a game where they played Butler, not really a you know a, a world beater. Yeah, I mean, they're world beaters in basketball. I would not want to see them on the court, but not on the football field, and. And the one the one advantage I do think Missouri State has is there are question marks about South Dakota State secondary. And you might have the most deadly FCS quarterback to wide receiver connection with Tyrone Scott at the wide receiver spot. 300 yards already this season and four touchdowns coming off a three touchdown performance against UT Martin. Can South Dakota State hold them? Because we know UT Martin was doing a great job. And then as soon as Shelly and Tyrone Scott started getting together, things really broke open late in the game and also can South Dakota state establish their running game. Isaiah Davis came into this season for a career averaging over eight yards per carry for his entire career and hasn't seen that this year. Yeah. Eight yards. You know, that's every two times he touches it. It's a first down, you know? Um, And that's like you said, that's going to be the deal. Can they stop the run and can they protect their quarterback? Um, And with that being said, you know, I'm sure it's not in Coach Petrino's mind, but he pulls this off. Uh, there's a group of five somewhere that's uh, that has somebody assigned to watch this and to watch him, and, and he'll 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 springboard off of this if he can make this happen. Um, yeah, and he'll have him ready to play. But it's just going to be can they handle South Dakota's up front? Uh, you know that front four. So who you leaning toward, Coach, in this top six matchup? Who you got coming out victorious this weekend? I like Dakota State simply because they've been here consistently and done it. Um, and like you said, they had basically a, a a chance to heal up anybody that was dinged up um, and get them extra rest during the game. Uh those guys, they, they know they've been there um, and they should be fresh. And I, I just think because they've been there, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll pull this one out. I don't expect a blowout, but I, I, I got to say Dakota State will, uh, will uh, take this one here. Missouri State will give it a battle, but I just don't think they have enough to, uh, to slow down Dakota uh, State and uh, running that ball. Yeah, I won't be surprised if this potentially is a rematch later this season, somewhere down the line of the playoffs. I think both of these teams are are, are going to be top ten teams throughout the year. I, I think it's going to be a close game. You know, I'm still, you know, uh, kind of going back and forth on it, but I, I would lean South Dakota State in this one just because I, I always tend to lean to the more physical team and the team that can control the pace more and the team with the better offense and defensive line. And I think right now that's South Dakota State. So let me ask you this: mm-hmm. um, You are you're more in tune to uh, to this than I am, so to speak. Uh, as a coach, we don't we don't as a coach we don't watch the rankings. Uh, yeah. <laughs> loser of this one, where do they go? Ooh, let me you know because I got my ballot. So you know because I vote in, you know in the in the FCS stats twenty five. But looking at it, you know Mon, you know Missouri State sitting at six right now. South Dakota State's tied for second with five first place votes coming into the week. If it's if, okay, so if this game is like a 23-20 game where it's just, you know, you could tell both teams are that good, I don't expect either team to drop out of the top 10. Okay. But if one of them goes out there and, it, you know, it's South Dakota State by 20 or South Dakota State by 30 or, or vice versa, Missouri State goes out there and puts one on them, then, then I could see them dropping out of the top 10. But I don't see either of these teams, regardless of the outcome, dropping much past the top 15 and definitely not outside the top 20 unless something just – bizarre right. happens like a Jackson State fam you or something like that I got you okay so the voting um still keeps the loser close yeah still keeps the loser close okay yeah I, I think so unless something wild happens because you know you look behind them you know Villanova plays a losing record Monmouth Jackson State gets Mississippi Valley State not going to impress many voters and then they're, they're you know some of Delaware I don't think plays a big game this weekend there's some games that just aren't going to be super impressive so you're going to say okay you know this team lost by three or seven to the number two team in the country and it, they led at one point and it was just who had the ball last 
you know, as a voter, you're looking, you still have to kind of look at, okay, they lost a game, but do you think if Villanova was in that game, they would have played that close or Sacramento state was in that game or Jackson state was in that game or whoever, you know, you're trying to move them down with. And also the, the other key is if Eastern Washington comes out there and smacks around Montana state, how high do they go? And and then you got to start making those those super big comparisons, or and then you never know with upsets. You know, I've seen it sometimes with the polls where a team loses a close one up top, but then it's this upset city, and number seven loses, number nine loses, number twelve loses, number thirteen loses. Then it's like they're not going to drop at all because everyone behind them lost. And so, but I don't think I would be hard pressed, man. If if come Monday, regardless of the outcome, both these teams are still firmly in the top twenty, and somebody's got to lose. Oh yeah. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, hey, but we've seen crazier thing, uh, crazier things. <laughs> there's, there's possibility of ties still looming out there, but the loser doesn't drop out of the top twenty. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, that that that's how I would feel now. Eastern Washington has a lot more on the line. I feel like out of all these teams of the you know because I think those are the the top four the, the top two games. Those four teams are all ranked. If Eastern Washington goes out there and does not look impressive against Montana State, being that they're you know sixteenth, fifteenth spot. There's some teams itching to to jump up there, and there's a lot of questions right now. You know how good is Tennessee State? They're sitting at zero and three, and so you're looking at Eastern Washington. You gave up a seventy piece to Oregon. I, I don't, as a voter, I don't fault a lot of teams for losing to FBS schools, but then you squeak by Tennessee State. We'll kind of see how they turn out later this season. Then you get, let's just say, your doors blown off by Montana State, missing their top three running backs. There's a lot of questions. And a lot of narratives surrounding EWU, and I wouldn't be surprised if they suffered a big drop in the polls if, if they get if they get blown out this weekend. I get that 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 makes uh, that makes plenty sense. Plenty sense um, when you're talking about the matchups in front of you and behind you. Um, yeah. With that being said, with what's coming ahead, who has the most to lose with a loss? Oh, um. I think I think either of those big sky teams because you know Missouri State they get lucky they don't draw North Dakota State and so their schedule after this I feel like is more manageable than a lot of these teams so if they suffer a close loss to South Dakota State I don't think I don't think they're in a lot of trouble now South Dakota State gets that North Dakota State matchup of course I say every year rivalry but their schedule strong enough where if let's say they finish the season with three losses and it's to Iowa Missouri State and North Dakota. North Dakota State, they're still in the playoffs. They're not, you know, they're not on the outside looking in. For me, it's Eastern Washington. If if you can't keep this competitive and you lose a big game, you still the big sky is gonna is just brutal this year. Um, Sac State looks legit. Montana still looks legit. You, you know, Portland State can't be overlooked. You got UC Davis. I mean, there's so many teams that can catch you on any given weekend. Weber State a top 15 team that, that's in the big sky too. The big sky is so top heavy that if Eastern Washington slips up here and things kind of get out of hand with a first year quarterback and, and you know, you lost your generational talent at, with Eric Berrier, things can get tricky for EWU. And if they're sitting at the end of the season, six and five, they're a bubble team. And a lot of these other teams, in my opinion, I think the South Dakota States, Missouri States, even the Montana States, I have I find a hard time finding five other losses on their schedule. I don't know if I could say the same about Eastern Washington if things go sideways this weekend, especially at home where you should have the advantage this weekend. I, I, I can buy that one. I can buy that one. I can buy that one. I'm yeah, with I you. mean, it, it's, it's going to be a tough weekend. There, there's some big matchups coming up. And also with South Dakota State, if they get a win this weekend, they probably – you know, as good as Montana's look, I think they they probably seal that number two spot up for now because they're, they're going to be the only team in the country with a top five win, unless Eastern Washington, you know, pulls the upset. You're looking down the line at that North Dakota State game, like, is that a national championship preview? That can be for all the marbles. Yeah, and in the Fargo Dome this year, and also on top of that, South Dakota State's won, I believe, three consecutive games over North Dakota State. As well, so you're going to have one versus two. You're going to have the narrative of the rivalry where it's like, okay, we're tired of losing, especially in the Fargo Dome. And then you're going to have the whole nation watching on that one. That North Dakota State South Dakota State game gets real interesting as South Dakota State goes out there and handles business this weekend. Man, that that game sounds so cold. I mean, you know, yeah. Hey, they're in the dome. They're in a dome. So, it, so it, getting well, to the dome, getting to the getting yeah. to the bar. <laughs> oh man, that sounds. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's in October. 
So ho- at least it's not in like that November. Cause I mean, I remember last year, South Dakota state traveled to um, Montana state last year, if I'm not mistaken. And they played that uh, semifinal game in like late December, early January. And I'm talking about on TV, man. I was sitting in my house and I was like, I need to go put a jacket on just to watch this game. It looked so cold. It was snowing and the crowd, every touchdown was throwing up snow. And I was like, no way. I, like I'm from Mobile, Alabama. There is no way. No, I'm, I'm from Florida and sitting there. And I remember that and the, the TV camera. And you can see from where the cameraman had, uh, I guess he had a heater. And you can see the heat waves rise. Yep. <laughs> man, I don't know that right there. It, and it, and people down here complain like SWAC fans I've talked to. They're like, man, it's so cold in Lorman and Jackson in November. And I'm like, man, I had talked to a North Dakota State fan last year. He said it was like negative fifty one day, and I'm like, negative fifty? No, sir. Like, <laughs> man, man, the state of Mississippi, the state of Alabama was shut down completely. At, yeah, at zero. You put it at zero in the state shutdown, but coach, man, I know you're a busy guy, but, um, man, let them know, um, you know, whatever you want to plug, man, social media, let them know where they can find you, man. And, um, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, what, what all corn state's got coming up this weekend, man, you caught me off guard with the social media, but I have that ready for next time. All right. But we got a, we got a hungry UAPB team coming in and, uh, it's one of those situations where, uh, the winner, the winner gets off to a, uh, front row seat um, on that side of the uh, on that side of the conference. Uh, it's going to be a big deal. Um, our home opener, not our home opener, but our home opener uh, in, you know, real time. Uh, yeah. So one of those situations where, you know, we're expecting an electric atmosphere. Uh, the kids have been really good this week, um, staying focused. Uh, the good thing about it is that we have a, a fairly young team, so to speak, to the situation. So uh, they don't understand the history, so to speak, of the uh, of the program. Um, they are buying into what Coach is saying, Coach McNair, um, and we're just harping on the little things that, you know, we need to control. Uh, and just understanding that when it hits zero in the fourth, you know, we want to be the team with the most. Uh, and then, like I said, that puts you uh, – it's only one, so to speak, but that puts you in a position to to be able to be in control of the West, you know. So, yeah. and that's all you want. That's all you want. Yeah, I think because I think whoever wins this game, if I'm not mistaken, with you know, because I think everyone in that division has a loss right now, yes. just about except for PV might not. I think PV's one and over Texas yeah. Southern. Yeah. So, so us and them, um, that's because yeah. we haven't played one, and they've only played one. Um, yeah. That's always tricky. Uh, when you open up, to me, when you open up, the loser of that first game is always looking up. You know, you're in chase mode. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we're happy to be where we are, and um, we look forward to being able to uh, tee it up Saturday at a decent time. Yeah, and- right. <laughs> Hey, it's all good. Um, um, yeah. you know, I got, I got, I got the text today, um, from Brian, and he was like, "Man, he was like, if you want to come down for the game, um, I got you." And I was like, "Listen, man, I'm gonna let y'all finish before midnight this week." I was like, "But I'm coming later in the season, so then we'll have another midnight game." And he, he got a, he got a crack out of that because, I, I, you know, I talked to a lot of people after that Stephen F. Austin game. I was like, "Man, y'all don't know how miserable it was." There were talks in the press box of them moving the game to Sunday, right? And we, and and I'll let you in on a little inside, uh. After that third delay, we were we were really expecting Stephen F to say, "Hey, thanks, man. We tried. We're going home." <laughs> you know? Yeah, so we were expecting, um, and then you know we had to flip the switch and get ready to go. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, definitely one of the toughest uh, I think I've been associated with, just because of the time and then the weather. You know yeah. that didn't better. Yeah, because it still was raining after the rain delay. It was just like missing all game long, and it was just miserable. But, Coach, man, I appreciate you guys. This will be coming weekly. We're going to be recapping some games, previewing, man, getting coaches breakdown of, across FCS football, talk a little bit of all corn state football throughout the season, guys. But, listen, for Coach Fred, for myself, for the Blue Bloods, man, we are out for right now.